Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. Um, can we all slowly go away from the slides and then we can go back and uh, have a coffee break at the end? So, um, good afternoon everybody. Uh, welcome to King's College London and uh, the Great Hall here. Uh, my name is Wynne Bowen, I'm head of the School of Security Studies. 
Um, and as you may or may not know, the school comprises two departments, the Department of War Studies here on the Strand and the Defence Studies Department down at uh, Shrivenham, where we provide academic support to the armed forces. Uh, and in combination, as a school, we form the largest multidisciplinary community of scholars in the world now dedicated to the research and teaching of all aspects of conflict, war, defence and security, be that sort of contemporary in nature, more historical, whether theoretical or whether it's uh, empirical. And our event today, hopefully, is going to be the first of a recurring uh, annual session during which we're looking to showcase um, to as wide an audience as possible some of the great research produced by our academics, but also by some of our students uh, as well. And I'm very glad to see so many people from uh, outside King's here today, which very much plays, I think, uh, to a core strategic priority of King's to be a civic university at the heart of um, London. So the topic we selected uh, today um, for this first security studies event um, was uh, understanding complex conflicts. Um, as you may know, both war and defence studies, uh, the departments have a long and accomplished track record of policy relevant scholarship that has generated new knowledge and understanding of war and complex conflicts uh, more broadly. So Michael Howard and Sir Lawrence Friedman are the two most notable colleagues in this respect, but they have paved the way for multiple scholars uh, to take forward the scholarly, scholarly traditions that they set in process. Uh, the King's Way, if you will. Research led education that seeks to bring knowledge and understanding to bear on real world policy challenges. So, serving to shape and transform, uh, if you will. So, we chose the two panels today, as I said, to showcase some of the best research that we have. Uh, the first panel is more historical in focus, obviously, and then the second panel uh, is more um, uh, focused on a contemporary uh, issue or set of issues. Um, so our first panel um, this looks at the First World War uh, and this the last year of the centenary commemoration. I think we'll all agree that the First World War was an incredibly complex affair, uh, politically uh, and also in terms uh, of its prosecution militarily with significant innovation in multiple domains by multiple actors uh, across its four years. And we're very fortunate today to have uh, Jenny Waldman CBE as the chair for this uh, session. Jenny is currently director of the First World War Centenary Cultural Programme. Uh, and among many, many other things, uh, Jenny was previously the creative producer of the London 2012 Festival, the finale of the Cultural Olympiad for the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And the 2012 Festival ran for 12 weeks and involved hundreds of events over the, across the UK and attracted 19.8 million attendances, which is pretty astonishing. So many thanks to Jenny for uh, participating today. And on Jenny's panel, we have two colleagues from Defence Studies and one from War Studies. And perhaps I'll let you introduce them. Uh, shortly. So we're also very lucky to have a second panel on Syria later on chaired by Emil Hokayem. Emil is going to be joining us at about three o'clock and Emil is the Senior Fellow for Middle East Security at the International uh, Institute for Strategic Studies where he specializes in political and conflict analysis including the wars in Syria, Iraq uh, and Yemen. And again thanks to Emil when he comes uh, for participating. And on that panel um, we have uh, uh, one academic from Defence Studies and then three colleagues from the Department of War Studies, and I'll let him be introduced <coughs> later on. Syria is clearly one of the most complex conflicts uh, uh, in history. Uh, it's drawn in multiple actors, both state actors and non-state actors, it's seen some horrific abuses of human rights and sparked a humanitarian disaster of vast uh, proportions, and with reverberations, uh, uh, reverberating effects, if you will, uh, much further afield. We won't be able to do justice, I don't think, to the complexity of Syria, but we'll have a good go at illuminating some of the important aspects um, of that. And as you have seen, um, we are also running a concurrent poster session, which takes us beyond the First World War, takes us beyond Syria, although uh, some of the posters do touch on Syria, I guess, um, but examining other aspects of conflict and security. And many thanks indeed to our uh, poster contributors, particularly our students who stood up and accepted the challenge of putting their ideas uh, on display, which is an uncomfortable thing for academics, I think, let alone for, uh, for, for students to do. And we have prizes for the best student poster and the runners up, which uh, Franz Burkut, our executive dean for the Faculty of Social Science and Public Policy, uh, will present at the end of the afternoon. So that's enough of an introduction from me. Um, I hope you enjoy the afternoon. Uh, come and chat if you want. Um, I'll be here all afternoon. And I'd like to just hand over to Jenny now for our first panel. Thank you. Thank you, Wim, and um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, 
not least because at uh, the First World War Centenary Programme, now given a slightly snappier title of 1418 now, we invite artists from around the world and across a range of art forms to reflect on the First World War and on its impact to our world today. Um, and as part of the research and development of each of those projects, the artists um, we introduce to a range of academics and historians and the archive of the Imperial War Museum and many others, uh, so that they can really be inspired by both the, um, the events of the period and the current uh, historical uh, uh, analysis of those events in order to draw their own conclusions and create new artworks that are seen by uh, people all around the UK. So I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to introduce our first panel who have um, a number of different perspectives on, uh, on the First World War. We have here Dr. Amy Fox, lecturer in Defence Studies at King's College uh, since 2016 and before that a teaching fellow at Birmingham University. Her primary research interest uh, focuses on the British Army in the First World War and last year she published a book, Learning to Fight Military Innovation and Change in the British Army 1914-18. to 18. And she'll be talking to us about military innovation and the politics of command in the British Army in 1914-18. to 18. Dr. Helen McCartney in the middle is reader in Defence Studies, having joined the Defence Studies Department here at King's in 2000. She's part of a group looking at the commemorations um, of the First World War during this centenary. And um, I first came across Helen when she was advisor to the um, AHC funded BBC World War I at Home project in, uh, in 2014. Uh, Helen's project, The British Soldier and Myths of the Great War, looks at the British soldier and how he's been represented both during the war and in its aftermath. Um, she also um, touched on our program again more recently when she wrote the contextual essay supporting now exhibition of Chloe Dune Matthews' um, photographs shot at dawn. She'll be talking to us about commemoration of, uh, and the First World War in Britain. And um, further to my left, I have to look at them to make sure that, that you're on my left rather than my right. I'm useless at that. Further to my left, Professor Bill Philpott. Um, Bill joined the Department of War Studies in September of 2001 as a lecturer in military history and became professor of history of warfare in 2011. He's published extensively in the fields of First World War history and in 20th century Anglo-French relations. Most recently, he's published War of Attrition, Fighting the First World War. And he'll be talking to us about um, the complex security challenge of resolving the First World War and uh, no better time to be doing that than now as we look toward uh, the whole period uh, in the centenary of centenary of armistice and uh, with the Tate Britain exhibition at the moment aftermath, which I would warmly recommend to all of you. So what we'll be doing over the next hour and a half is inviting each of our speakers to, um, to give their papers and then um, inviting questions uh, to each of them and indeed to all of them after that. So first of all, I'd like to invite Dr. Amy Fox. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, uh, Wim, for inviting me to speak at what is a, a really um, important conference, I think. Um, hopefully, you'll get something out of my paper. What I try to do here is kind of blend the historical um, analysis of the First World War with a few contemporary resonances. Um, so a little bit of a mismatch in a way. Um, in his lecture to the Royal United Services Institute in 2017, the now former Chief of the Defence Staff, Stuart Peach, reached back to the experience of armed forces during the First World War in order to highlight the importance of innovation to the military. I'm struck by just how much innovation there was 100 years ago, he remarked. When you read the detail of the Battle of Cambrai, it was very much about innovation on the battlefield and achieved a remarkable effect. The First World War also resonated in General Sir Nick Carter's lecture on dynamic security threats earlier this year. For Carter, then Chief of the General Staff and now the new Chief of the Defence Staff, the First World War gives us a great chance to actually think about what the next war might look like. The Army, he remarked, has a project underway that looks at mobilisation plans for the future force in the event of conflict on mainland Europe. It's called Project Henry Wilson. 
in reference to the British Army's Director of Military Operations in 1914. He was largely responsible for the mobilisation plan that led to the deployment of the British Expeditionary Force to the Western Front. Indeed, in many respects, the First World War and the experience of the British forces who fought in it is proving a rich source of lessons for the British military today, whether that's in terms of mass mobilisation, the reconstitution or regeneration of the force, sustainment, but also war fighting, not just in mass, but also at scale against a peer or near peer enemy. For both Peach and Carter, the threats facing UK defence, whether they're state or non-state based, require certain interventions and responses, and this isn't just an increase in spending new kit or capabilities, although I'm sure that would be incredibly welcome. Many of these responses are intrinsic to the military organisation itself. A higher appetite for risk taking, for example, an increased premium placed on adaptability, investment in junior leaders, <coughs> and a command philosophy that enables and encourages initiative. But fundamentally, there's a simple need, and that's to innovate. For Peach, innovation should not be a process or a slogan. It's the way we respond to the new threat environment. If we do not change with the threats that we face, we risk being overmatched. Now, the need for militaries to innovate is nothing new, of course, whether we look in time of peace or time of of war, whether we look at today or a hundred years ago, the need to innovate to retain a competitive advantage or military edge is paramount. And much of this need, I think, relies on a culture that provides for, that enables innovation. And it's perhaps no surprise then that the heart of the MOD's 2016 Defence Innovation Initiative is the vision of empowering, and I quote, a culture that is innovative by instinct. Now, I put to you that for the Army of the First World War, innovative by instinct is actually a fundamental tenet of its organisational culture, and that in many respects, it's a military organisation capable of proactive innovation and change. Now, of course, my contention doesn't necessarily chime with the popular perception of the Army of the First World War. It's not quite in line with our Blackadder Goes Forth view of the Army. But even today, in the last year of the centenary, it's still an organisation that's largely viewed as conservative, as out of touch, led by unthinking, callous generals. It's certainly not viewed as an agile organisation, either conceptually or physically, nor is it viewed as particularly flexible or creative. Even contemporary commentators at the time held the same view. David Lloyd George, Britain's wartime Prime Minister, believed that there was a rigidity, a restrictiveness about the methods employed by the army, which allowed no play for initiative, imagination and inventiveness. Lloyd George's opinions, I think, not only just on senior commands, but also on the British Army's officer corps more broadly, have had an enduring and something of a distorting effect actually on how we view learning and innovation in the army of the time. So what I want to deal with, with the time uh, given to me, is, is challenge this view, like any good historian would. Instead, I want to highlight the role that both senior commanders, but also those at mid and junior levels, played in creating the necessary conditions for innovation to occur. But I also want to show as a corollary how those individuals work together in order to stimulate, facilitate, and coordinate innovation across the organisation. And note here that I'm referring to the organisation, not a particular regiment or branch or formation, because to my mind, innovation, if it's to be done effectively, has to be an institution-wide undertaking, underpinned and enabled by an effective organisational culture. And that's really kind of the, the first substantive point I want to speak to, this issue of culture. Because I don't think you can talk about command in the military without talking about the organisational culture within which it sits. In his contribution to the Wavell Room, for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's a British <coughs> professional military education blog. In his contribution on speaking truth to power, Lieutenant General Sir John Kisley used the example of Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, the Commander-in-Chief of the British Forces in the First World War. He uses this example of him turning white with anger at being questioned by two staff officers. 
And for Kisley, what's interesting is that Haig's reaction tells us more about organisational culture than it does about the field marshal himself. The implication then is a culture that didn't brook criticism, that was inflexible, that was intolerant. Other modern commentators and scholars have supported this view, suggesting that the army's bureaucratic framework and the culture of the pre-war period actually militated against effective learning. Another suggesting simply that the army did not encourage open discussion or reassessment. Now time unfortunately prevents me from detailing counter arguments in full, but I'd suggest the opposite actually, and that from my research into the army, I found that it has a pretty flexible culture, which was necessarily shaped by a number of factors, such as British national identity and the geostrategic realities that Britain faced on the eve of the First World War. The army's culture was one that emphasised pragmatism, that prioritised individual action, and really demonstrated a preference for principles rather than prescription. And that actually, rather than acting as a break on innovation, this culture provides the army with the ability to adequately examine and promote new ideas and solutions. And this culture is propagated through a number of means. You have the regimental tradition, for bad or good, um, training regimes, but perhaps more importantly, the army's capstone doctrine of the time, which sought to empower the individual, the subordinate, as well as encouraging individual initiative. Now, there are some scholars who question the continuing relevance of culture in wartime, but for me, I think it's clear that the army's culture, at least, set the preconditions for its ability to innovate. But its focus on the individual and its incredibly personalised nature was in many respects a double-edged sword. Because such a culture facilitated experimentation and diversity, but with that comes a plethora of different methods and approach, which militates really against the uniformity that one might want or desire in a military organisation. But if we boil this down to a simple truth, is that this culture just prioritised individuals and that individuals often learned in ways that made best sense to them. And this is no more evident than in um, the British Army's officer corps, who were known to flout higher directives and orders of immediate superiors, and in many respects these individuals had the ability to influence institutional behaviour to a considerable extent. What I want to sort of do now is, is show how this culture actually sort of played out in practice, as it were, and how it enabled for the creation of an environment for commanders in particular to facilitate innovation. For me, innovation can only really occur in an organisation that's actually rich in connections and relationships, and how those innovations are identified and how they're diffused is dependent on the size, the extent, and also the degree of coupling of those various relationships. For me, the Army's culture underpins the development of a network of individuals that are working together to coordinate and stimulate innovation. By using their own personal but also their professional connections, they build up effective working relationships with others in different parts of the organisation. So in a way, this is bringing a little bit of kind of social network theory into the study of the Army and its conflict. So for me, there are sort of three particular roles that one can discern in this network, and this reaches from the men in the field all the way up to those at the top of the army. So first off, you have kind of experts, and I use this term quite loosely rather than with the baggage of the Victorian and Edwardian period. These experts who have a certain knowledge, experience, or idea that sets them apart from their colleagues. And these individuals um, in a First World War context are responsible for the development of platoon tactics, military mining, inland water transport, and artillery survey techniques, to name just a few. What's interesting is that there's no one type. These experts come from a diverse range of backgrounds. Some are young, university students. Some are middle-aged. Some are scientists, academics. Some are career soldiers. Some are other ranks, non-commissioned officers. And you get some who are brigadier in rank. Yet despite these differences, there are similarities in that and at least in the case studies I've looked at, they're quite marginal characters, so even though they might hold significant rank, are not in the heart of the organisation. Some actually straddle the very uneasy boundaries between the military and the civilian worlds as well. But what binds them all together is that their expertise gives them initial legitimacy, which proves really important in attracting the attention of the second role in this network, which is that of the broker. 
So the broker is there to kind of generate support for that initial idea. So someone comes to this individual with a good idea, and it's for them to actually then further enhance the legitimacy and credibility of that idea. So if we were to think about it in project management tabs, we might see them as project sponsors. And these individuals are responsible for connecting disparate and discrete groups together. So in many ways, they're boosting the army's cognitive diversity by bringing different people into conversation. And they act as kind of almost bridges over which ideas and innovations can flow. But I think it's important we don't just see them as, as gatekeepers um, or intermediaries because they often had significant resources in their own right, such as their own influence, their own political capital, and they wielded those resources in order to affect this process. Importantly, they had the ear of the leaders, so our patron figures, if you will, and this is a final role in this network. So these are your kind of institutional elites, often holding general officer rank, whose prestige and support were vital preconditions for these kind of ideas to succeed. Again, in project management terms, we might see them as our project champions, fostering innovation by creating a coherent vision and encouraging purposive action amongst their subordinates. And I think in many ways, for those of you who are familiar with some of the innovation literature, it kind of reflects a lot of Stephen Rosen's work on early ideas around the visionary senior leader who creates promotion pathways for their subordinates. But what these high-ranking figures do, I think, is use their legitimacy, use their position in the organisation in order to protect these brokers and also these experts, giving them the time, the space, the environment to actually go away and solve and address challenges. Who are these people in a First World War context? So I appreciate some of you might know quite a bit about the First World War, some of you maybe not. Um, the commander of the British Third Army formation, an individual called Edmund Allenby, who goes on to significant fame in the Palestine campaign, actually oversaw, oversaw the establishment of the first senior officer's school on the Western Front, which encouraged officers to ventilate their views in an almost insubordinate way. Um, these views were actually pushed up to Allenby as commander, as it was felt, and I quote, that it was no bad thing for higher command to realise what the front line thought of them. Another example we might highlight is Henry Rawlinson, he's the commander of the British Fourth Army. As well as actively patronising artillery survey techniques and developments, after the Battle of the Somme in 1916, him and his chief of staff actually played a really important role in circulating tactical improvements among the force. Subordinates were encouraged to speak truth to power, with one officer actually praising, and I quote, the obvious desire to get at the real truth and a wish to obtain the ideas of commanders. All well, this is fine in, in principle, but I think fundamentally without that supportive culture encompassing both structure and leadership as a wraparound, ideas and knowledge will remain fixed or undeveloped. Individual unstructured initiatives will remain just that. The French general Philippe Pétain had remarked in 1915 that the war had engendered a lack of curiosity and mental laziness in combatants, that new equipment, new ideas were only known by those who developed them, that what was actually learned was little shared across the force or with those who didn't take part. As Jonathan Krauss of this parish has remarked, military command in many ways is required to act like a pump intelligently circulating good ideas and encouraging the replacement of less than good ideas, let's not call them bad ones. The British Army, I think, was similarly reliant on this kind of command structure, a structure that understood that acted on the ideas of men in the field, an effective training structure in order to spread those ideas across the organisation, but also a network of individuals that are empowered to promote them. And I think it's through this network or this networked way of looking at innovation that we can see how a culture that's innovative by instinct actually pervaded the entire army. Now I appreciate that what I've put forward there promotes a rather unorthodox, somewhat positive view of the army's experience of the First World War. And that certainly may be so. Um, but what I see with my research into the army is that innovation was very much everyone's business, whether you look at it at the local level, whether you look at it horizontally or more vertically, the army, I think, reveals a willingness to interact with and reach out to those individuals with good ideas and recognised expertise, whether they were civilians or soldiers, whether they were junior or senior. In short, then, 
It's the ideas that have value, not the rank. And I think there's, there's probably much to be said here um, about the British Army's use of civilian expertise and the role that High Command actually played in actively reaching out for that. Um, and I don't think we should dismiss the Army's own agency and proactivity in this process. It wasn't a conservative consumer, per se, but often a co-creator of knowledge and expertise. And I think we can look at the Army's voracious appetite for you know, the business, the science of statistics, for example, to show how it's actively reaching out for new methods and effectively, or essentially, new ways of trying to shorten the war itself. So, while we can call the Army's culture innovative by instinct, it was far from perfect. You know, we're talking about a complex <laughs> hierarchical organisation. There are always going to be pockets of scepticism. And I think this is natural because change is often perceived as being quite threatening, particularly for those who feel that their role or their prestige or their very well-being is, is somehow at risk. So friction, stickiness, these are just part and parcel of the innovation process. And rather than ignoring these and seeing these as you know, things that we don't really need to consider, they should be regarded as fundamental interrelated factors um, in the process, not as distinct or independent or problematic. One officer in 1919 charitably remarked that jealousies, difference in opinion, want of coordination, want of an exact system laid down on paper, would generally, I think, have been fatal amongst other nations, but it worked with us on the whole because every officer was doing his best to help the work along. So to try and pull this together. So to go back to Lloyd George's comment, um, in that far from allowing no play for initiative, imagination, or inventiveness, I think the Army is, is absolutely capable of facilitating and promoting innovation. And this isn't limited to a particular branch. Unfortunately, times precluded me from giving you lots of detail on these case studies, but we see this in different <laughs> operational theatres, in the artillery, engineers, infantry. And I think in many respects this is spurred on by the victory imperative, but it's also coupled with the threat of possible defeat as well, which means that innovation is very much everyone's business. I think where innovation is concerned more broadly, and this has resonance, I think, with the armed forces today, is that we need to reconcile ourselves to the fact that it is an inherently unpredictable and messy process, particularly when you're reinserting human behaviour and agency back into the heart of this conversation. It's also not something that can be forced or injected into an organisation. All these calls for organisations to be more innovative, I think, are misguided and actually overlook its inherently problematic nature. And we need to almost reconcile ourselves to the fact that innovation is a process. Might be a slogan as well, but it's certainly a process. It's one that relies on an interplay between culture, people, and risk, particularly the risk of failure. As a result, it's not easy, and it's certainly not cheap. We see innovation bandied around a lot in austere times, but changing culture and changing how people view or think about change is actually both time and resource intensive. I think we also fetishize and commodify concepts like learning and innovation, and we present them as these little neat packages that move from point A to point B in a seamless fashion. And I think this is dangerous because it overlooks the challenges and reality of failure, of trying to identify good ideas over bad ones, um, and of the need to negotiate inherent frictions, such as trust, relevance, and motivation, or of course, a lack thereof. So for me, command actually plays a really vital role in mitigating some of these challenges, as well as both empowering and promoting a learning environment. The management theorist Peter Seng remarks that leaders are responsible for learning. Commanders, even in contemporary forces, I think need to be comfortable listening to dissenters, promoting self-reliance and, where necessary, actually subverting the chain of command itself. And I think in many ways this ties into the need to be open to receiving what Chilcott has referred to as reasonable challenge, as well as actually offering that as well. I think there are numerous examples in the British Army in the First World War of commanders at all levels driving innovation and taking considerable risk. But there are also those who worry about their job, their reputation, their prestige, about the number of casualties they might sustain. For the Army of today, there are some officers who highlight attention within their service that reasonable challenge, while necessary, is actually incompatible with a command culture 
that prioritises or places job security as paramount. And I think command has a responsibility to create an environment, whether that's in the barrack room or whether it's on the battlefield, for innovation, creativity, problem solving and learning to take place. And I think in short, to create a culture that is innovative by instinct, we need to, I suppose, put in capabilities and new kit to one side that addressing risk, managing failure, challenging proofing, <coughs> and speaking truth to power, without doing all of these, armies will be woefully underprepared to fight the next fight. Thank you very much for your time. in the Army of the First World War. Please hold your thoughts and, uh, and questions on that and we will move on to uh, Professor Bill Dilpott. Thank, Thank you. what I want to say with a brief comment. When I agreed to talk on this topic, I didn't realise I'd only have 20 minutes. I will do my best to summarise what is a very complex <coughs> series of events uh, and uh, try and understand uh, partly what the challenges were faced at the end of the First World War, uh, some of the approaches that were available uh, and the problematic nature of these, and to what extent these might uh, be considered to be successful or not. And of course the Great War conventionally ends in November uh, 1980. But I would stress that the security challenges that we see are not, uh, or at least only partly, a consequence of the timing and the nature of the ending of the war. So the events of 1980 are important, but there are bigger uh, issues we have to understand as well. Uh, I think they're summed up deeply uh, by David Lloyd George, in fact, who we had mentioned already. He gave an address to Parliament in December 1917, summing up how he felt the war was going at that point and how it had gone in 1917. And he tried to identify some events that he thought would be significant 100 years later. And uh, in this he was quite persevering, I think. Uh, he suggested that the Russian Revolution was very important. He noted the advent of the United States into world politics. Uh, America joined the war earlier that year. He noted also the setting up of something called the Versailles Supreme War Council, which was an institution for managing the Allied uh, war effort and strategy more efficiently uh, drawing on uh, representatives from Britain, France, Italy and the United States. Uh, something uh, that I think is generally overlooked as a precursor to modern uh, interstate cooperation organisations, but actually Lloyd, jo Lloyd George himself described it as the machine of the League of Nations, that in itself is going to be the beginning of something which will have a greater effect in international relations than anyone can imagine at this particular moment. He also identified the emancipation of the Arabs from the domination of Turkey uh, as a great positive of this year. Of course, the British had uh, backed the Arab Revolt, particularly associated with the action of Chidi Lawrence. Uh, in terms of military events, uh, to draw some positives from what well, was a difficult year on the battlefield, he identified the captures of Baghdad and Jerusalem as the key events of the war that year. Now, within a year from this speech, the war would be over but one has to then wonder whether actually the war had been won at that point. Certainly, two wars were resolved with armistices, armistices that were signed uh, in October and November 1918. One was the war against Turkey in the Middle East. Uh, this was some ways an old-fashioned imperial war that actually had started in November 1914, and the other was the uh, more traditional balance of power war uh, fought against Germany and Austria-Hungary, uh, principally, uh, which began in August 1914, the conventional First World War uh, that came to an end with final armistice with Germany uh, on the 11th of November 1918. But war had not ended. Another war, a very important war, had broken out in 1918 as a result of the events of 1917, and that was the war uh, against international Bolshevism, uh, and this would have to be fought out in the years following the First World War. It was a civil war in some ways in Russia, but it was a war with international dimensions and implications. There were 
also some specific challenges that actually predated the war uh, or led to its outbreak back in 1914. There were some challenges that were actually a consequence of uh, how the war had developed, how it had been conducted. Some of the challenges emerged from the collapse of states and empires during or at the end of the war. We have domestic and international challenges. We have international uh, political, and social, political and social challenges. We have local, we have regional, and we have global security challenges, all of which have to be addressed. The longest standing challenge perhaps is that of pre-war European security. This was why the war breaks out in 1940 in the first place. I think this uh, contemporary uh, sketch gives an indication of the, of the problematic nature of Europe for 1914. Uh, at the risk of broad oversimplification, which all I can do in the time I've got, this is a war that breaks out over great powers' issues of state and their security interests. For example, for Austria-Hungary, uh, perhaps for Russia, their issues of nationality and domestic security in Eastern Europe. For France, it's an issue of security against Germany. Uh, this will be the second invasion of France by Germany in living memory. For Germany, it's quite a security against France and her Russian ally, the fact that Germany felt uh, surrounded uh, and uh, threatened on both sides. For British security, it's a question of the balance of power on the continent of Europe, and more precisely the issue of Belgian neutrality, which was a, its compromising of which was a direct threat to British maritime security. And the other great powers that then joined the war had similar agendas. Turkey joined the war in November 1914, was reasserting its nationality. Italy, that joined in in uh, May 1915, was essentially fighting its final war of unification, uh, finishing off a process that had begun in the middle of the 19th century. These are the issues that start the war, uh, much to dis disputed even now. Uh, these are the issues that spread the war between 1914 and 1916. These issues remain to be resolved when the war comes to an end. And these are essentially issues of what we would call old diplomacy. They were issues of honouring alliances and settling treaties. They, as an example, the Treaty of London of April 1915, was signed with Italy and promised the Italians uh, irredenta uh, Italian territories under Austrian rule as their reward for joining uh, the Allied side in the war. The problem is, even while these treaties were being signed, the war was changing. Really by the end of 1914, and certainly during the course of 1915, what had begun as a statesman's war was becoming a popular uh, a popular patriotic war, uh, rather to a great or less extent depending on the state we looked at, but this was a phenomenon uh, that characterised the war as it develops uh, in its first two years. Also the nature of the war becomes apparent in 1915, it's a war of uh, mass mobilisation with associated shifts in political and social relationships in all the belligerents as a result of the strains of this process of mobilisation. Summarising briefly, you see the rise of uh, the power of labour, organised labour through trade unions. You see a changing role of the state, uh, start to challenge the role of private enterprise in conducting the war. And you see increasing uh, state interference in and power over the lives of citizens. You also, as the war goes on, see a realignment of domestic politics, essentially uh, toward the political extremes whether they be pro-war on the right or anti-war on the left. Then the belligerents pass through a very, very difficult year, a year of attrition in 1916, uh, the year of the Battle of the Somme and Verdun in the west, but also of the Isonzo battles in Italy, the brutal offensive on the eastern front. The war is getting into its stride, it's showing its true nature, nature of uh, mass warfare, huge casualties, increasing stray, strain on the individuals and collectives of the states of the way in the world. And then in 1917 you have a year of increasing disenchantment with the conflict. Uh, William Mulligan uh, suggested that this would result in a presentation of the moral purpose of the war in which the continuation of the struggle for a particular vision of future peace was the basis 
for the remobilization of civilian populations and armies. So 1917 is a key year. This is the year that Lloyd George is reflecting on. It's a year where in some ways the war that had been fought between 1914 and 1916 is fundamentally going to change and shift its nature. Also, it's a year in which the war is still expanding. America enters the war as an associated power and brings a very different, a more populist, a more idealistic uh, agenda, a security agenda, the Wilsonian agenda associated with President Woodrow Wilson uh, into the mix. But other people have other ideas in 1917 that are going to complicate things. You get the idea of an international socialist peace promoted at the Stockholm Conference uh, in the summer, uh, a peace without annexations and indemnities, exactly challenging the capitalist imperialistic principles of the states that have gone to war in 1914. And it's popular, it's adopted as, uh, by the uh, Kerensky government after the first uh, revolution in Russia in 1917. Uh, the German uh, Democratic parties in the Reichstag passed a peace resolution supporting this sort of peace against the will of the German High Command Emperor in Germany in the summer 1917 as well. So you see populism starting to challenge authority structures as the war develops. And then at the end of the war, sorry, the war, at the end of the year, you get a monumental event, of course, the Second Russian Revolution. Uh, the Bolshevik coup with their uh, slogan, Peace, Bread and Land. Peace, ending the war, was the fundamental objective of the Bolsheviks. Uh, but their method of doing so, by armed conflict, would challenge the social and political structures of all uh, European states. And then, in 1918, very quickly, the war suddenly comes to an end. Uh, brief chronology up there of what happens, but essentially between August and November, all four states in the Central Powers Alliance are defeated uh, one by one at the same time, uh, and suddenly uh, you have a situation where there has been a victory, but before American military intervention has really become uh, decisive, as Wilson had anticipated. Most people were expecting the war to carry on into 1919, even 1920, whereas a, a military event which I can't go into brought the war to a rapid end. Now the armistice terms that resulted reflected uh, essentially immediate security concerns of the states that had uh, defeated their adversaries. For example, the armistice in Germany uh, called for the liberation of French and Belgian territory, an army of occupation in the Rhineland, uh, the elimination of the threat from the German high seas fleet required uh, by uh, the maritime British uh, Empire. These armistice terms wouldn't give you security in the long term, they were not the basis for a lasting peace. Uh, Lloyd George, in December 1916, when he'd become uh, Prime Minister, had argued that the war would be fought until the Allies got uh, restitution, reparation, and guarantee against repetition. Uh, but that's uh, a sound bite. It doesn't actually give you much of a basis on which to negotiate uh, a practical settlement. Uh, people have been saying the same thing about a certain agreement signed by uh, Donald Trump uh, uh, here yesterday. But we'll see where it goes, as it were. So this is the way the war developed. Which was the key year, we don't know, but all of them certainly set challenges for the post-war uh, security settlement. Also, there are contested ideas of peace. Uh, Wilson intervenes in 1917 and he claims he wants to secure peace without victory, which will be unacceptable, of course, to world leaders who are fighting this war for national interest. And also, of course, to many of their people who are patriots at heart and believe in what the war has been fought for. And that they feel they need to justify the efforts and sacrifices already made. Which is why the International Socialist Peace, although popular on the left, was not going to gain a foothold. Uh, throughout societies. But unfortunately, with the victory that comes about in 1918, the Allies have secured victory, but without peace. Peace still has to be negotiated thereafter. And this is going to take place against a background, not of, not of quiet calm, but of continued conflict. Although eventually World War ends in 1918, perhaps World War ends in 1923, when the final peace settlement 
is signed. There's a longer period of peacemaking, or an equally long period of peacemaking, as there is of war making. And the question is, who's going to make peace? How is it going to be made? How is peace going to be enforced and uh, sustained? I like this picture. It shows the Hungarian peace penitentiaries actually being escorted in to sign the Treaty of Trianon in uh, 1920. And note they're marching or uh, walking past a French guard of honour, in theory, or effectively a demonstration of French power. In some ways, uh, France is the, the top nation that comes out of the First World War, and in some ways it's a peace conference that's going to take place in Paris. It's going to be largely directed and dominated uh, by French statesmen, uh, and it's going to try, as it were, to address some of the old security issues that France has to address within the context of the newer security issues that have emerged out of the war. But this is against a background of conflict. You have war makers who are challenging the peacemakers at every turn. You have new states and new polities, some of which are represented at the peace conference, some of which are not. You have issues of civil war, of border wars. Poland, for example, is fighting six wars in 1919 to try and establish or expand its borders, which haven't been agreed. Uh, Yugoslavia and Italy are fighting about their respective borders. Uh, you get rapacious old states, uh, Romania in particular. Romania has joined the war in 1916, been knocked out uh, with Russia in 1918, come back in again in September 1918 in order to try and grab what she hadn't got uh, through the treaty she made with the Allies in 1916. The Romanian army were the only Allied forces on the ground in Eastern Europe at the end of the war, and that allowed the Romanians free reign to annex uh, what they wanted. This was in the interest of the Allies, for example, Romanian forces were instrumental in suppressing a Soviet uh, regime established in Hungary in, uh, in the middle of 1919. So what you've got, if you put it, put it in a sentence, you've got an untested new world order, and you've got it juxtaposed with the, res with the rather resistant vestiges of the old order. And this, I think, is the nub of the security problem that you have to settle at the end of the First World War. Who's going to make peace and what sort of peace should it be? Is it a peace uh, made by the victors? Is security for the victors alone? Is it for the liberated, those populations that have emerged from the empires that have collapsed in the First World War? Or should it, as far as possible, we be for everyone? It is a French military victory with Allied help, but the Allies tried to dress it up as a, a collective victory. This is the obverse of their victory medal. All Allied soldiers received this medal, and it said the Great War of Civilization, or, or in French and Italian, the same words uh, for other uh, nations. So they had this sort of collective idea of what they are trying uh, to do, uh, but in practice, uh, how that works out uh, is rather more problematic. There's idealistic options uh, presented by Wilson, be the realism of the statesmen uh, that have uh, been making the war up to this point. So some people see the war as a liberal victory, uh, but there still remains an essentially nationalist and conservative uh, political tradition throughout Europe uh, that has not gone away and has to be accommodated. But there is a reaction to the old style of diplomacy. Wilson has promoted what he calls open diplomacy, an end to treaty and alliance, territorial arrangements, uh, a collective security system to be set up uh, through a League of Nations. Wilson turns up triumphantly in Paris in 1919 in the belief that he can then dictate peace. Uh, and he realizes pretty soon he's not going to get things all his own way, and he soon heads back to the United States and leaves it in the hands of his diplomats. Because essentially the Wilsonian agenda, the New World agenda, clashes with the old. Uh, I like uh, what Clemenceau rather cynically said, the good Lord gave us ten commandments, we broke those. Wilson has given us 14 points, we shall see. <laughs> <coughs> Our European states would have more traditional and rather different agendas. Uh, for France, for example, security against Germany 
is paramount. Germany must be kept weak and isolated. Germany is to pay for the war, to pay the war reparations, and a war guilt clause will be written into the Versailles Treaty to justify this approach. Germany is to be dis disarmed and occupied. And Britain will back this attitude to a certain extent. Britain certainly wants uh, German naval power to be broken and wants to maintain its maritime control of the sea. There are also some matters of empire to be addressed. Uh, we must remember that the great powers and leaders are imperially minded. Uh, would the war consolidate or expand their empires and how would it change the security relationship between motherland and colonies? Yes, on the British example, the Dominions have asserted their nationhood in return for the support they've offered to the motherland. Ireland, on the other hand, had now embarked on a process uh, increasingly bloody uh, of breaking away from uh, the British Empire. And you've got to add to that uh, the enemy uh, within the states, international uh, communism, uh, formally created uh, with the foundation of the Comintern in March 1919. This represented an internal threat, a social threat, as well as a, uh, an international threat, uh, ultimately epitomised in the uh, war between the Soviet, uh, or should we call it the Soviet Union at this point, between, between Russia and uh, Poland uh, in 1920-1921. Uh, and Bolshevism, communism as it became, was designed to have a cross-border appeal to populations, created a domestic security challenge. Uh, they promised to bring about an end of the war uh, in 1917 by essentially ending class conflict, but they were willing to fight for this objective. How do you deal with this threat? By intervention in the Civil, in the civil War, in 1918-19, or later by a policy of uh, containment. Also relevant to what we're going to talk about later, how to deal with the problem of the Middle East. Uh, in some ways, you postpone the problem by creating League of Nations mandates, but there's a democratic uh, deficit in that part of the world that is perhaps still in evidence, something uh, that will uh, be mentioned later, I guess. There's an artificial construction of states out of the provinces of the former Ottoman Empire, where borders do not fit uh, with ethnicity or uh, religion. And more generally, the principle that we have to contend with is that the, the end of old empires emancipates peoples, uh, but they don't have any particular tradition of self-government or of democracy, uh, which are the principles uh, by which they have been emancipated. And there's a more general crisis of uh, domestic uh, government uh, alongside this as well. Partly it's a crisis of capitalism. This is a liberal capitalist war that ends in a, a socialist conflict, you might call it. <coughs> uh, Post war problems of state debt, uh, currency failure, uh, business collapse, uh, prolonged economic crisis leads to hungry people. And people understand when people are hungry, uh, that leads to social unrest and to revolution, as we witnessed in Russia and Austria-Hungary as the war was still going on. The other side of this is the rise of the army uh, and the fact that populations of belligerent young men have been brutalised by the war and come home and are prepared to take up arms and fight for these new causes uh, on the streets. So this liberal victory does not translate into a stable liberal society. Uh, fascism, which I can't talk about in detail, presents itself as an alternative to liberalism and something more capable uh, than resisting uh, communism. So essentially, if you look at the states of uh, Europe between the wars, uh, most of these, even Victorian states, will not survive as liberal states uh, until uh, the uh, end of the 1930s. The Czechoslovakia lasts until Germany uh, invades, Britain lasts, Scandinavia and Benelux, but otherwise uh, the democratic uh, basis of the peace simply isn't there. So, in some ways, the peacemakers do not achieve what they want. Uh, Foch, uh, refer, Foch was the general who led the Allied armies in 1918. He referred to the peace settlement of Germany as an armistice 
or 20 years. But I think there are some more general problems uh, inherent in the security uh, situation at the end of the First World War. Germany and Russia were the issues. Uh, could Bolshevism, communism be contained? Could Germany be made and kept weak? The answer to this was no, and we're all aware that uh, within 20 years it was the power vacuum in Eastern Europe uh, between Germany and Russia that was the powder, the powder keg, as it were, in which the, uh, the Second World War uh, exploded. What can we conclude uh, from this? Well, I think Lloyd George is fundamentally right about the key events uh, of the end of the war. American hegemony, uh, Russian rivalry, have defined geopolitics for the rest of the 20th and into the 21st century. Uh, you mentioned Baghdad and Jerusalem. Yes, they were still flashpoints in the early 21st century. So Lloyd George had certainly witnessed the birth of the modern world in 1917 and its new security challenges. These were not challenges that could be engaged with or resolved by the pre-1914 methods uh, and statesmen, although they certainly tried. Uh, 1917 is also a geopolitical fault line, perhaps, between a century of imperial Pax Britannica, as you might call it, and confrontational and unstable post-imperial world system that followed. Now, quasi-democratic Britain negotiated its way through this better than many other states. Uh, the four authoritarian outdated empires that fell in 1917 and 1918 uh, could not. But sooner or later, the British Empire too will be swept away by these new forces. Uh, it was American money, American hard power. It was communist ideology. It was nationalist self-determination. The other thing Lloyd George noted after Versailles, uh, sorry, noted after, after 19, it was the Versailles system. This was the system set up to win the war, but it was also very important in making and sustaining the peace. Future peace and security lay in cooperation. Uh, the fact that America refused to ratify the Versailles Peace Treaty and Wilsonian uh, liberalism uh, proved rather ephemeral uh, and impractical, didn't mean the principle was not there. You will see uh, that collective security uh, doesn't go away. Lessons are learned and enacted uh, after World War II. Uh, Interestingly, the European Economic Community uh, is the end result, I think, of the cooperation process set up in the First World War that Lloyd George was referring to. Uh, Monet, uh, Jean Monet, the, uh, sorry, Jean Monet, the guy who led the process of establishing the European economic communities, was a member of the French delegation, uh, economic delegation at the Paris Peace Conference, and had been active in the Versailles uh, apparatus as a civil servant, since he was the, 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 the Keynes of uh, France at this point. It's difficult in 20 minutes to uh, elaborate a very complicated situation. I hope I've done so. I hope I've explained the complexities some of the problems, some of the failed solutions. Uh, there's a tendency these days in Europe to see the First World War as Europe's tragedy. Uh, but I think uh, we should include the post-war period in our analysis, and maybe this is Europe's uh, tragic comedy that follows. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hillbot. Um, please hold your thoughts and questions, and we'll turn now to Dr. Helen McCartney, who will talk to us about the commemoration of the First World War in Britain. <coughs> Some ideas are privileged over others, and some meanings can be omitted altogether. As time passes, the meanings of commemoration, they often change.
They can be influenced by the immediate concerns of those designing or participating in the commemoration and the form in which those commemorations um, are put forward. They tell us as much about us how a society views its present and its future as its past. So in light of this, I want to look at the commemoration of the First World War during the centenary period and given the topic of our discussion, examine her contemporary attitude to British armed forces and attitudes to conflict more generally, British attitudes to conflict more generally, have influenced centennial commemoration. And I hope to persuade you that the centenary has seen a diversification of commemorative themes and messages. In the decades leading up to the centenary, British themes of First World War commemoration were fairly narrow. There was a concentration on the British experience on the Western Front, mainly from the point of view of the soldier, and the message was often one of futility. The soldier was seen as a victim of a mismanaged war. Since 2014, I think, though, that these familiar, narrow, futility narratives, although they're still dominant, there are other themes and other messages that are getting out there. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the public has a greater grasp of the complexities of the conflict. Can you speak into the microphone? Sorry. It doesn't necessarily mean that the public has a greater grasp of the complexities of the conflict. Just that it illustrates the reasons behind commemorative choices are constantly shifting, and in some cases are as complex as the conflict itself. Is that better for everyone? No. Okay then. So, my first theme, the diversification of theme rather than um, message. To illustrate the diversification of themes, I want to look at how refugees appeared as part of the British commemorative landscape. The First World War caused the uprooting of millions of European citizens, and yet this hasn't been a major part of commemorative activities in Britain in the years leading up to the centenary. The centenary, co coinciding with numerous refugee crises for Europe, has led to a new strand of commemorative activity. Multinational companies, including Nestle, numerous media outlets, local museums and community groups, have highlighted the 250,000 Belgian refugees who made Britain their home between 1914 and 1919. Here's a good news story that can be told about the First World War. The idea that organizations and local communities welcomed refugees on a large scale, generated funds, and housed people in need. That is something that actually can be celebrated about the First World War. You don't have to look at, look, look at the, the, the mass of dead there. You can take a different focus. Indeed, the First World War mission memorial that we can see up here to the 6,000 Belgians who worked in East Twickenham and Richmond at a Belgian-owned hand grenade factory was part funded from Richmond Council's Civic Pride Fund. So it gives you an idea, at least the way they presented it to get the money um, uh, in, in the first place. These types of community projects have also involved reaching out to Belgian relatives of former refugees honouring their forebears' courage and enterprise, while creating new international connections and an international angle to the commemoration. And this is something we often haven't seen before in British commemoration. It's often been very narrowly focused just on British experience, but by looking at refugees, you've automatically got an international angle there. In reality, the story of the refugees isn't always that rosy. Belgian refugees hadn't been remembered in many communities in the intervening years, in part due to their rather rapid repatriation by the British government at the end of the war. They were they're unceremoniously kicked out in, 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 in some ways. And community relations hadn't always been smooth. Yes, they'd been welcomed to a large extent in 1914, but by 1915, um, sometimes community relations were getting a bit fraught. These aspects are often, although not exclusively, glossed over by some projects that's difficult history that doesn't necessarily fit in with their overall aims. However, I think the fact that refugees, and by extension the importance of allies, particularly the Belgians, are now seen as a legitimate theme of commemoration. The other project I want to look at 
in light of what we're discussing today, is the 1418 now collaboration with Damon Albarn to reunite members of the Syrian National Orchestra, helping to mark the centenary of the Sykes-Picot Agreement in 2016. This project drew a direct line from the British-French agreement to carve Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire into their own spheres of influence, drew, drew a line to the Syrian conflict today. Its theme was also refugees with a very contemporary focus. Many Syrian music musicians had been forced to leave the country as a result of the conflict, and so coming together in June 2016 was an important and symbolic moment. In interviews surrounding the event, music musicians stressed the transformative power of music, but also showed the human face of the refugee. Damon Albarn was keen to counter negative attitudes towards refugees by showcasing their talent. As one musician put it, and I quote, the media tries to show us as savages, as terrorists, but there are different sides to every country in the world. There is the musician and the graphic designer and the coffee shop worker we also need to show the normal side. So that's one, one theme, I think, that can show how um, the First World War is being diversified, the commemoration of the First World War is being diversified by theme. But I also want to put forward the fact that the First World War is also being diversified by message. I've identified three key messages here. The first is this familiar script that sees the First World War as a futile conflict. Casualties dominate commemoration, leading to an interpretation that both the objectives of the war and the way in which it was prosecuted were pointless, with devastating consequences for families left behind or coping with those physically or psychologically wounded. But this is still very much the dominant issue dominant image of the First World War in the public sphere and has been reinforced in recent years by British experience of the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts. Direct comparisons were drawn over the last decade, suggesting that the lessons of the First World War had not been learned and reinforcing the British public's unease with the use of force. And this was the public image I genuinely expected to see during the centenary and only this image. But actually, I think we can see that there have been other interpretations that have been coming to the fore. This futility narrative, I'd argue, now coexists alongside two other significant scripts. The second acknowledges the tragic character of the First World War, but sees the deaths as a blood sacrifice for future freedom. This narrative suggests more broadly that armed conflict can have a positive outcome and can contribute to peace and security. The concept of the First World War securing freedom, it's, it's, has, it's been argued that that's pretty nebulous and actually pretty meaningless. But nevertheless, you see that repeated a lot in, in, in commemorative, different commemorative forms, and I think it has a strong resonance for many people. For these people, the First World War has a redemptive aspect, and the vast number of deaths did and still hold meaning. And the third narrative, I'd argue, is different again. Whilst the first two revolve around the moral positions on the utility of war, the third largely divorces the conflict from state goals, illuminating instead how the war illustrates more universal human values that have resonance for people today. In following this practice, those commemorating today may have been influenced by recent trends in the way in which British war dead in Afghanistan have been remembered. The notion of personality, Anthony King has argued, has become integral to definition and production. So the way in which recent conflicts have been remembered is probably helping to modify not only the forms of commemoration that we're seeing from the First World War, but also the messages that we're getting through. Okay, let's look at some centennial projects to see if I can illustrate some of these. Oops, here we go. So I've got three examples here. The first is the Tower of London his installation, blood swept lands and seas of red. It was inspired by a line in the will of the Derbyshire soldier who was killed at the war. The artist Paul Cummins and set designer Tom Piper created the artwork of eight, 800 and, sorry, math, 
can't even say it. An awful lot of ceramic poppers <laughs> in the base of the Tower of London, with each poppy representing the death of a member of the British and Imperial forces. Funded privately and designed to mark the outbreak of the First World War, the installation grew slowly between July and November 9, 2014, and was conceived as a temporary transitory piece of art, with the poppies sold for charity at the end of the period. What I think is really important about this type of commemoration project is that the fact it's offered a lot of opportunities for people to interact with it. There was the opportunity to be involved in the artwork itself in person. People applied to be poppy planters and helped to create and dismantle the visual memorial. This action by itself has been described as a piece of theatre with over 20,000 people participating, while millions observed and often queued to look on and watch the sea of poppy. Row. Those spectators also participated in creating, creating the artwork by leaving photographs and crosses and dedications to ancestors along the moat wall and engaged remotely through Twitter, Facebook and an online dedications page and a nightly roll of honour ceremony where names nominated by the public were read out. <coughs> Due to its popularity, the wave and weeping window sculptures that formed formed part of the original display, have now gone on tour around the UK, orchestrated by the now. To date, they've been seen by over three million people. So this is a very significant memorial that a lot of people have had some kind of interaction with. The second project that I want to highlight is the Shrouds of the Song project. Privately funded, it's staged 19,240 hand-stitched shrouded figures to represent the dead on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. It opened to the public on the 1st of July 2016 in Exeter and was reconfigured in front of Bristol Cathedral in November 2016. During the two-week exhibition, over 145,000 people viewed the exhibit in person. And the project had a popular Facebook page and a website which showcased public responses to the artwork, photographs and video. Drone footage of the Exeter display has now been downloaded over 13 million times. And this had, a, again, this had a charitable element, contributing um, its profits to service charities. Following the success of the initial exhibitions, again, it's got, got new life. A campaign was launched to generate another display to mark the centenary at the end of the war. And that now has backing from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And the first part of the display was exhibited in the grounds of Salisbury cathedral last week and that's where this photograph up here is taken from. And the third and final project is entitled There But Not There and it, again it's one designed to have national reach. The artist believes that the war dead in Britain are no longer visible to the British public. They're there on memorials they're named, but they're simply names on memorials. They don't really have any meaning for the community. His idea was through six foot aluminium, aluminium silhouettes of soldiers, um, seen in this picture in front of the Ministry of Defence, um, all perspex figures that can be made to sit down. They were ideal for sitting in a church pew or, or in a community setting. This would bring the dead back into the community. The figures are available to buy to raise money for military charities backed by senior retired military figures with inspiring wounded military patrons, the project has recently received a substantial cash boost from the government. So there are the three projects. What can they tell us then about centennial commemoration? If we look at these images, we can see that all the projects draw a direct link between the UK armed forces and the British Army of the First World War. And what I want to argue is that um, this takes various different forms. You have the inspiration of the projects in the first place, you have the military's participation in their creation, and you have the military being beneficiaries in the form of um, charitable donations to, to, to military charities. I want to have a look at these three um, themes in, in a bit more detail. So for some, contemporary conflict inspired their work in the first place. Rob Hurd, the artist responsible for the shrouds, began by thinking about the consequences of contemporary wars for soldiers during his own recovery from injury. While his project has reflected all three public scripts about the war, Hurd himself, I think, linked through identifying with values rather than a moral stance on war. 
he spoke of the bravery and tenacity of contemporary soldiers battling back after worse injuries than his own. But he also spoke of the bravery and tenacity of First World War soldiers, explaining that stitching the shroud sometimes 15 hours a day, despite continuous pain in his hands, provided him with a focus which allowed himself to do something extraordinary in the wake of his own severe injury. So in sharing the same value of tenacity, both with the soldiers he was commemorating and the veterans for, um, which benefited from, 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 from the money, he was able to make a connection between himself and two different um, communities. We can also see that the UK Armed Forces are participating very visibly in the commemorations. Look at those photographs. Here the imagery is connecting the contemporary soldier very much to um, the dead of the First World War in particular, because the, both the shrouds and the poppies represent the dead. And I think that is actually really quite striking. Service personnel and their families participated both by planting poppies and laying out shrouds, and by, and by making dedications, often to those serving now as well as in the past. Indeed, I think this is a really interesting aspect of these projects, that individuals have used them to mark more recent wars as well as the First World War. The link between today and the First World War was usually made with reference to that redemptive, that second interpretation of the war, the idea that the war has a purpose and the war had a meaning. And the quote from Sergeant Christopher O'Brien, who was laying out the shrouds a week ago, illustrates this quite well. He spoke about, and I quote, soldiers who lost their lives for the greater good so we could have the life we've got today. And he linked this to remembering friends that he had personally lost on military operations. Similar dedications were made on the online Tower of London dedications page for the poppies and on reflections cards collected in Liverpool in 2015 when the poppies were on tour. But it's not just the serving soldiers who participated. Military charities too have connected with projects through directing them, enabling them, and becoming the beneficiaries of that commemoration. And again, they usually subscribe to that second theme, that redemptive interpretation. So for example, the 2014 British Legion Poppy Appeal single was filmed amidst the ceramic poppies in the Tower of London moat. And Joss Stone commented that the song chosen, a cover of Eric Vogel's Greenfields of France, stood for, and I quote, the peace and sacrifice made by so many. She overtly linked the sacrifice of First World War soldiers <coughs> with those serving in 2014. Although ironically, through the use of an anti-war song with the more challenging uh, versus omission. Now charities are treading a really fine line in interpretation here. Soldiers laying out shrouds or planting poppies can be interpreted in lots of different ways. They don't have control over how the public is going to interpret this. The link can just as easily reinforce the victim image of the soldier and the futility of war um, as, as seeing death and injury as having some kind of worth. And this was certainly demonstrated in the pe people's online responses to the poppies. You see both, um, both ideas there in, in online responses. Military charities aren't blind to this conundrum. There's a widespread concern that the contemporary portrayal of the soldier as a victim of recent wars is impacting negatively on the armed forces. And perhaps this explains the explicit mission of their, but not their, to educate the public on the sacrifices made then and now, as well as healing hidden wounds. So they haven't taken this redemptive interpretation for granted. They realize that they are playing a part and that their, their interpretation will be but one that is made. I hope I've persuaded you that British public narratives about the First World War that have emerged from these projects are more diverse than those we've seen over the last decades. I still think the futility script's dominant. And we're not at the end of the commemorations and I haven't had time to number crunch and, and look at all the projects that are out there. But I think we can still see that there are more, more diverse, even if they're not dominant, messages that are coming out of this centenary. And that, I think, is very encouraging uh, for the future commemoration. Thank you very much.
Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, please take your seats. Uh, we're going to start uh, shortly. Um, my name is Emil Hikeyen. I'm a Middle East uh, Security Fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, covering conflicts uh, across uh, the Middle East. Um, I am. Uh, my work has uh, focused on Syria, so I'm particularly pleased that uh, King's College is, uh, you know, uh, um, taking, uh, giving this this issue uh, the, the the academic and, and policy uh, attention uh, it, uh, it requires. Um, you know, the Syrian uh, conflict has gone through uh, uh, many phases. Uh, I don't think we're yet at the end. Uh, contrary to uh, the expectations out there, there's still a lot of fuel among uh, regional and local actors for a bit more uh, uh, misery and, and, and drama. But it's still a good time, uh, seven years into that conflict, to uh, you know look back and try to uh, come up with uh, you know uh, broad insights and, and conclusions about uh, about this war and what it tells us about uh, modern warfare. Um, so King's has put together a, a, a brilliant panel uh, looking at various aspects of this conflict. I will very briefly uh, introduce the speakers. Uh, first, Renu Landers, uh, who uh, I met a long time ago in Beirut when uh, I used to enjoy the, the good food and the nightlife there, uh, but has done a lot of great work uh, with ICG uh, back then and uh, now works on, um, on the Middle East, particularly Syria, Lebanon and, and Iraq. Um, he, he'll cover a very interesting uh, aspect of the war, which is what, what, how the, the regime and other actors have adapted to the militiification effect um, and how this has uh, um, brought new questions about sovereignty, uh, statehood, etc. But I can uh, do more. Uh, Charlie uh, Winter is also here at, uh, at King's, uh, where he covers terrorism and insurgency. Um, he's done a lot of work on, um, on uh, uh, Daesh and, uh, and HCS, uh, Nusra. Actually, your latest report is on my desk. I haven't uh, had time to, to, to read it yet. But, you know, interestingly, uh, uh, ways of uh, looking at how uh, those jihadi and militant groups uh, uh, govern, conduct war, uh, appeal to uh, audiences abroad, but also at home. Uh, then Dr. Martin is a lecturer at, uh, here in the War Studies Department um, and she's going to be looking at the chemical warfare in Syria and try to derive some uh, conclusions about uh, the utility of chemical weapons, uh, whether the norm uh, about uh, the non-use of chemical weapons in war uh, uh, still holds, uh, if, if yes, why, if not, why. Uh, <laughs> Um, so that's going to be interesting. And then uh, uh, Professor Witham uh, is also a professor here at Military Essex. Uh, and he will look at the ethical dimensions of, of that war and how to choose uh, partners and alliances in such a complex uh, uh, human and political terrain. Um, so, Renan, you go first. Uh, yeah, thank sure. you. Um, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, uh, thank you for all for being here. Uh, well, obviously, uh, I won't be able to go into much detail in the, I think, maximum 15 minutes that I, that I have. What I'm going to do instead is just to give you uh, a bit of a taste of a research project that um, I've been working on together with my colleague at the War Studies Department, uh, Antonio Um and which was kindly 
our field work that was currently funded by the uh, by the faculty. Um, now, the, the Syrian war since 2011 may present a watershed development in how internationalized civil war uh, is, uh, wars are being waged. Now, most strikingly, we argue here a foreign-sponsored network of transnational volunteers effectively battled a vicious uh, insurgency to the effect that by the end of uh, 2016 or so, uh, a once beleaguered and enfeebled authoritarian regime, the Syrian regime, managed to regain the upper hand and is currently seeking to consolidate its uh, wartime gains. Now, the Syrian case points up to the significance uh, of the intense use of non-state militias in counterinsurgencies at an unprecedented scale. Uh, and the involvement therein of transnational networks mobilized around sectarian identities and encouraged, coordinated, and sponsored by third parties, including state and non-state actors. Um, accordingly, Iran is heavily involved by its Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps of the Basaran, Russia by its armed forces and private military companies uh, operating in, in Syria, um, and uh, the Lebanese armed group uh, Hezbollah and uh, the Iraqi <coughs> Shiite cleric and his followers, Grant Ayatollah Ali al Sistani. They all have been instrumental uh, uh, to the emergence of a complex web of militias seeking to preserve the Syrian regime and, and to defeat uh, the uh, opposition and rebel forces. Now, the Syrian experience uh, seems to underscore the military payoffs of such a specific mode of uh, wartime mobilization, and uh, we think is therefore likely to help inform key state sponsors uh, Iran's future approaches to and involvement in many conflicts uh, currently and, uh, and latently uh, affecting uh, the Middle East. Now, furthermore, state incumbents and non-state groups worldwide, especially within authoritarian regimes, are likely to pay close attention to what is happening in Syria in this, in this context, as it suggests pathways to gaining regional and international leverage far beyond the reach of their conventional military capabilities. Now, the work I have been doing with Antonio Giustosti aims at untangling, documenting, and analyzing Syria's case that has put the notion of a networked war at an entirely new level. Uh, our key research objectives uh, include to assess how and why non-state armed groups are formed and deployed through and around foreign sponsors, draw on and shape religious uh, or uh, sectarian identity, and affect Syria's stateness and regime claims in state sovereignty, and last but not least, enhance sponsoring parties' capabilities to project military force externally. Now for this, uh, we, just a, a note on, a kind of a conceptual note, we, we draw on two kinds of literature that uh, are, on the one hand, very helpful in, in informing our research project, but also fall uh, uh, significantly short. There's one body of literature and tradition in uh, the study of civil wars, which looks at um, how states have outsourced violence to, to militias fighting uh, on, on, on their behalf. What consequences this has for stateness, for state strength and weakness and sovereignty and, 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 and so on. But most of this literature looks at these dimensions uh, exclusively in a, in a domestic context and ignore the external, international, transnational dimensions that are so, so uh, important in the, in the Syrian case, and arguably in other cases as well. Now, on the other hand, there's a body of literature that looks at, at proxy wars, uh, and that term has been coined during the, the Cold War, uh, being primarily used in the context of the, you know, the conflict between the great powers, uh, basically them fighting wars against each other, um, in, uh, in other uh, arenas uh, in ways that, that um, uh, do not go as far as risking a nuclear confrontation at the, at the, uh, in that period of time. The problem with the notion of proxy war is are multifold, though we apply it to the current uh, Syrian uh, civil war and conflict, uh, which is often done in, uh, in many media commentary and, and academic uh, accounts. Uh, firstly, what often is assumed in the context of the study of proxy wars is that, um, we, that we are talking primarily about state uh, actors. State actors uh, give support 
or sponsor or to help train and equip uh, forces that are associated with, with uh, receiving uh, states and, and, their, and their regimes. Now what you see in the Syrian context is, uh, is interestingly, I think, uh, is the proliferation of non-state actors uh, as, as being prime you know, uh, actors in, in, this, in this context. So for example, uh, the, the so-called principles or those sponsoring uh, actors include a non-state actor like, like Hezbollah. Uh, they also include a non-state actor like uh, uh, Ali Sistani from, from, from Iraq, uh, alongside and next to and in collaboration with state actors uh, including Russia and, uh, and Iran. On top of that, the, the, presumably the state actors uh, sponsoring proxy forces and militias in Syria also include the Pastaran, which itself has a, a very ambiguous relationship to the Iranian state by its establishment and its evolution uh, ever since, and still has many of the characteristics of, uh, of being a, a non- or quasi-state uh, militia operating next to and in parallel with the uh, Iranian uh, uh, regular uh, armed uh, forces. To make matters even more complicated, um, uh, an actor like Hezbollah can be looked at as both, uh, as both uh, 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 a principal, a sponsoring actor in this, in this context, and the proxy itself of, of Iran. Uh, so there is a lot of variation here that is not uh, very neatly grasped by the, by the notion of, of proxy, of proxy uh, uh, wars. Now another characteristic that, that uh, is flanked up in the Syrian context is the um, is the sheer you know, complexity of the number and the number of, uh, of uh, principles and, and actors in, involved. So often with the proxy kind of relationship, it is assumed that there is one state outside or two uh, competing states that, that sponsor uh, their respective clients in, in a certain, in a certain uh, civil war. But here we have uh, many, uh, multiple uh, actors, state and non-state uh, principles, sponsoring various militias, and then a host state and regime that, um, that also maneuvers in, this, in, in, in all of this, which basically points up to a much more complicated situation where there is, we, we, we assumed, uh, a lot of bargaining and negotiation amongst these, um, these actors, among uh, each other, uh, who all will have, um, at times, um, um, uh, similar uh, strategic goals and interests, but often will also uh, be at odds with each other. And as the conflict um, evolves and the, uh, the regime's uh, consolidation of its, uh, its military victory seems uh, more pertinent, uh, these uh, principles will, will likely uh, uh, start to clash with, uh, among, among each other. So basically, what we did was to kind of merge two literatures. One literature that looks at, um, at the proliferation of non-state militias uh, in, in civil war fighting on behalf of a regime in counterinsurgency efforts, um, but primarily in the domestic context, and then the proxy war uh, kind of approach that looks at the external dimensions and uh, using the concept of both and, and yet questioning uh, the assumptions made by uh, both these literatures. Now, just a brief note on, on, on how we did this. Uh, obviously, it's tremendously difficult to do research on a live uh, civil war, internationalized civil war, like in, like in Syria. Uh, there's an authoritarian regime, which, also, which, which always made doing research on the ground uh, uh, difficult, if not impossible. Um, and then there is the, you know, the active fighting uh, going on, which, which makes it impossible to, to go for us uh, as researchers to enter, enter uh, Syria. So I, I used to go to Syria uh, often, but uh, I've stopped doing that for obvious uh, security uh, reasons. Now luckily, uh, and that's I think some of my uh, 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 fellow panel members will comment on that as well, uh, there are various methodologies developed that try to circumvent these problems. Um, we hope to have made a con contribution in that respect as well. Uh, because basically what we did was to, uh, to set up and arrange and organize a network of local researchers who did the interviewing for us, uh, obviously uh, you know, carefully managed and steered uh, by, by us. Um, and many of them were actually uh, taking part in the militias themselves. So they started interviewing their peers 
which is one like major kind of uh, set of sources that we that we used. And this process of interviewing is still is still ongoing, but the kind of first results uh, started uh, trickling in uh, uh, already. Um, and uh, that, just to give you uh, the taste of our findings so far, um, our interview findings on Syria's foreign-sponsored uh, pro-regime militia still need to be cross-checked and, and contextualized to assess their accurateness and relevance fully, of course. But what they thus far most strikingly signify is that the complex networks and chains of command involving pro-regime militias in the Syrian war match uh, the uh, um, com uh, complica uh, complicated approaches to the intricate and negotiated role of state-sponsored militias in armed conflict in, in the literature that I uh, briefly touched on. Uh, by our focus on foreign or external sponsors, sponsors of states, um, uh, pro-regime militias, we hope to contribute by placing such, such um, uh, constellations in an international and transnational <coughs> setting. Um, a comprehensive state devolution of violence has been instrumental to the Syrian regime's relative military successes against a once sprawling insurgency. It also underscored how the regime has rapidly adjusted its, uh, its status to what was required to counter, and perhaps at some point in the future, defeat the insurgency essentially in two ways. By allowing and encouraging militias to fight on its behalf and by drawing in foreign actors to help organize, fund, train and staff them and come to the regime's rescue. Such has had the seemingly paradoxical effect of on the one hand reinforcing the regime's resilience while at the same time counting its claims to be the sole embodiment of Syrian state sovereignty. The extent to which or whether the regime will be able to reclaim its sovereign state attributes will undoubtedly depend on complex negotiation and bargaining, among other things, on the future of such militias in Syria, the spoils of war that will be offered, and, last but not least, Iran's determination to continue to use a mobile army of Shiite fighters, transnational Shiite fighters, operating from Syrian soil, to pursue its regional ambitions, uh, ambitions versus Saudi Arabia, versus Israel, but also uh, to bolster Iran's leverage vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Now that process of negotiation and bargaining is currently in full swing, and I think rather surprisingly for us at least, we, we got a, a very close look at, um, at, the, at the, the dimensions of this bargaining from our uh, interviewees. <coughs> Just as the regime maneuvers among its main foreign sponsors and proxies and, uh, and principals who vie for power while insurgents uh, are on the retreat. Uh, I'd be happy to go in a little bit more detail in the Q&A and uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. CSR, which is the International Center for the Study of Radicalization uh, in the War Studies Department, on the Syrian conflict over the last few years. The particular thing that I've been focusing on is the Islamic State and uh, focusing on a particular facet of the Islamic State, that is its, uh, its strategic communication operations, so how it communicates both with supporters inside Syria and Iraq and also outside Syria and Iraq how it gets those people to join it, but also how it engages with and intimidates its adversaries as well. So the way I've got into all of this, and this is the, the principal tool for my um, data collection, is using open source uh, methodologies. So using uh, the fact that the Syrian conflict has been massively uh, mediated over social media. I think it's absolutely true that it's the most socially mediated conflict in history. Uh, and using that as a lens to understand how these groups, uh, in this case the Islamic State, are operating, how they're branding essentially their insurgency. So on the screen here, and I apologize in advance to um, my fellow panel members because there's a few videos in here, so you might have to crane your necks or um, just try and see it on this tiny screen. Um, 
this is Telegram. So this is where the Islamic State shares, disseminates, distributes all of its propaganda, um, whether it's a video or a magazine or a newspaper or an audio statement from Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Everything comes through here. This is uh, all of that in Excel. So once I've collected it, I've been archiving for the last few years, and you get a really interesting, staggered view of how the Islamic State's narrative uh, priorities, how its strategic communication objectives have sh shifted in accordance with its evolving circumstances in Syria. Uh, and then, once you've done that, you can get some nice little graphs. I've only got a few graphs in here, so um, I won't bore you too much with them. But the thing that I'm going to focus on in particular in this uh, short 15 minutes, um, after just quickly running through what the objectives behind any jihadist group's strategic communication uh, program is, is the appeal. So I'm going to look at the, the brand of the Islamic State, and I'm going to look at it as it has been uh, manifesting itself um, in recent months in particular. So first of all, on objectives. So why do jihadist groups communicate? Why do they make propaganda? So whether this is the Islamic State or Hayat Tahrir al-Sham or AQAP in Yemen, for example, it doesn't just need to be in Syria or Iraq. The first is to propagate the ideology. This is to get people thinking about their particular form of jihadism, so recruit people, essentially. The next is to legitimize the group. So this is more defensive messaging. This is where, the, uh, in this case, the Islamic State, counter-messages, it engages in counter-propaganda, or what it perceives to be counter-propaganda, against what, again, it perceives to be an intellectual war against it. And then we have the last point, which is particularly prevalent in the context, particularly salient, salient in the context of the Islamic State, and this is the intimidation of adversaries. So whether that's using propaganda to amplify the impact of a terrorist operation in the West, or whether it's using propaganda to transmit uh, a video of uh, a Western or non-Western hostage being executed in a horrible way, that is geared towards intimidating adversaries, among other things. But I think the primary objective there is intimidating adversaries. So on to the appeal. Um, I've broken it down into three different things. So just to explain this pie chart that you have before you. April 2018, um, is that, that denotes that all of this uh, data is from the month of April 2018. So all of the propaganda that the Islamic State disseminated during that month has uh, gone um, into this uh, pie chart. Of course, there are some items that are very difficult to categorize, so I excluded them. It was uh, about three out of 100 and, uh, 137, I think it was. So blue designates that it was warfare-focused propaganda, orange designates that it was civilian-like focused propaganda, and then that little sliver of grey, that is uh, victimhood-focused propaganda, so the aftermath of uh, airstrikes, artillery strikes, what have you. I'll go through each uh, in the next few slides and show you an example, and hopefully there's audio, but not too much audio, because um, there's some video clips in here too. No violence. So the first aspect, so this is about three quarters of uh, all of the Islamic State's propaganda, audio visual propaganda, whether it's photo reports, videos, newspapers, whatever. It is focused very much on warfare. This is very different to 2015 when it was more focused on utopia than anything else, the idea of civilian life inside the Islamic State. So now the focus overwhelmingly is on tactical, on the ground news updates. It's very much like war journalism, uh, but of course through a very particular lens. The emphasis is continuously on the strength and steadfastness, courage, capability of the Islamic State's soldiers and their ability to uh, engage in a very professional uh, conduct on the battlefield. I know that sounds uh, kind of um, strange considering how um, well known this group is for its barbarity, but still, that is the uh, approach that is taken when it comes to mediating its particular war at the moment. It also focuses uh, on delivering through this warfare-focused propaganda strategic policy statements. So there have been more of these in recent months than there were a couple of years ago. Um, there's been a bit of a fusion of, of policy and um, propaganda, simple kind of branding propaganda, uh, over the last few years. And again, that's in response to the shifting circumstances of the group. And the next, video, uh, the next slide is going to show you uh, one minute from a video that was released in February of this year, where the Islamic State did something which is entirely unprecedented. Uh, in the context of global jihadism, it essentially, uh, not just essentially, it explicitly uh, welcomed and celebrated the involvement of female combatants on the battlefield in Syria. And this is, I mean, that's a huge deal uh, for global jihadism. Of course, other groups have done it in the past, but they've kind of viewed it as a dirty secret. In this case, though, the Islamic State was wholeheartedly embracing it, and that's very significant. This should also give you an idea of 
the uh, kind of day-to-day -day warfare material that we're talking about too. And following them, the chaste Jahid woman journeying to her Lord with the garments of purity and faith. for the honor of her sisters imprisoned by the apostate Kurds. They launch the battle to avenge the chaste women. It is a campaign that commences a new era of conquest with Allah's permission. There's a huge amount to unpack there, but I don't have any time to unpack any of it. Uh, if there are questions in the Q&A, I will happily take them. So the next uh, aspect of the Islamic State's propaganda that I'm going to talk about is the victimhood focus stuff. So um, in the month of April, there wasn't that much of it, uh, but it has been a continuous atmospheric presence in the group's brand for the last few years. Victimhood is very, very important to any extremist group, whether they're jihadist or not. So when the Islamic State is talking about it, it focuses on the aftermath of airstrikes and artillery strikes mainly showing dead or dying children, or dead or dying old uh, men, never women, um, but it does talk about the women that have been killed in airstrikes. Uh, so this is not only to justify the hardships that supporters are going through in theater, so people who are still living in territories controlled by the group, but also it's used to try to uh, incite active terrorism in the Islamic State's name abroad. This idea of retributive violence is very important to the group. Uh, I'll show you a very quick clip of uh, a video that was released uh, a few weeks ago from southern Syria, and this doesn't have any dead bodies on it. Uh, it's focusing purely on agriculture and uh, the, the destruction of agricultural land uh, as a response or as a result of Syrian opposition artillery strikes. That just gives you a very, very quick flavor of what I'm talking about. As I say, this, uh, even though this, this particular aspect of uh, Islamic State media isn't particularly prominent in this month, it is incredibly important to uh, the group's ideology and its ability to attract supporters and also keep those supporters uh, as supporters. So keep people part of the group, keep people thinking that they're fighting for something. So the last aspect, and this is one of the ones which uh, interested me most over the last years is, is this idea of a civilian utopia. So whether that's in Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan or Yemen or West Africa or Egypt, wherever the Islamic State has a foothold, it tries to chuck out a bit of utopia propaganda from that foothold. And the reason that it does this is because it is trying to show that it is uh, walking the walk, not just talking the talk. So I, I think it's very useful to understand a lot of what the Islamic State does through the lens of its competition with rival jihadist organizations like Al-Qaeda. And what the Islamic State has been doing very, very systematically in its propaganda over the last few years is presenting itself as a, a, a fully-fledged caliphate. So uh, <coughs> providing a very detailed idealization of the situation in the areas that it controls. So this is geared not just towards attracting people by showing how nice it is to live there, uh, but also to show that it is actually fulfilling the jihadist pro uh, project, whereas groups like Al-Qaeda, uh, it perceives not to be. And this has been a very com comprehensive and very consistent idea that, again, has been present throughout the last few years. Fluctuating, though, back in 2015, over half of all of the Islamic State's propaganda focused on the civilian utopia side of things. Now it's much, much less than that. Though over, um, across January, February, March, April 2018, it did increase slightly. Uh, the next video is uh, a clip from um, uh, a May 2018 video uh, from Euphrates province. So that's the, it, it spans, uh, straddles Syria and Iraq. It's what the Islamic State calls Euphrates province. And it essentially, aside from uh, kind of trying to undermine the credibility of uh, democratic um, electoral systems, 
it presents what the Islamic State is doing instead. So it tries to show, yeah, this is bad, and look at what we're doing instead. You'll get a sense of what I'm talking about here. It covers a lot of material, but this is just focusing on social welfare. عندما فرق فيه سد فينا ألف جاني وأذاق الناس قام في ذل وهواني في ذل وهواني So this is all food which is being given up extensively for free to uh, the needy people <coughs> in your greatest problems. So that just gives you a very quick flavor, um, whistle-stop tour of what the Islamic State brand looks like um, today. Uh, it changes a lot, it changes a, a great deal, but those are the kind of foundational thematic elements that have been present since the very beginning. Um, I've got one more video to show you, and then no more videos, and I'll uh, shut up. This one focuses on the trajectory of the Islamic State, and I think it's very, very interesting because it shows how this group, which is, uh, by all intents and purposes, according to accounts from, um, from uh, Western governments, defeated. It shows how it uh, is trying to navigate through this period of defeat, how it's trying to frame it as not actual existential uh, defeat, but one more step towards ultimate victory. Um, so it, it's interesting, very interesting uh, for that reason, and it's had a lot of, um, uh, it's been very prominent um, on Islamic State forums, so Telegram earlier, it, it's constantly being brought up there as a way to show, yeah, we may have lost all this territory, but you know what, the Islamic State project, the Jihad, is still uh, on track. The prophecies are all still on track. <laughs>
So um, that's just the, the, the first couple of minutes of that video. It's uh, an hour long, <coughs> focuses on various things happening in Syria, Iraq, and Egypt. But you get a sense of, of how this group is trying to um, frame, reframe, position itself in the context of what's been happening over the last few years. I think um, what we're presented with now is uh, something of a, a new dawn for it. Um, in, in fact, actually, after that introduction sequence is over, uh, the screen goes completely black, and then in white writing, um, it, it uh, says that the jihad has entered a new phase, uh, one where it focuses, um, according to this video and according to other publications of the Islamic State over the last few months, where its focus is more on attacking uh, the enemies of uh, Islam, perceived enemies of Islam, rather than trying to uh, focus on the, the, the proto-state, government stuff in Syria and Iraq. And so with that proto-state taking a back seat, the Islamic State needs a new unique selling point, or it's trying to work towards a new unique selling point. So a way for, again, for it to define itself against uh, its rivals, a way for it to uh, kind of engage in this, this game of jihadi one-upmanship, make sure that it remains a premier uh, jihadist group out there. And I mean, it remains to be seen whether it will be able to do this, but certainly in its propaganda, the focus is more on encouraging and inciting terrorism, uh, so attacks specifically against civilians and uh, civilian government. Um, inside Iraq, Syria, showing that stability isn't safe, uh, and also outside of Iraq and Syria, in Western countries, in Southeast Asia, uh, in Russia, in Africa, where. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. And what I'm going to be presenting is a paper um, that I've done with two colleagues in the Will War Studies Department, Jeffrey Chapman, who's a PhD student, and Dr. Hassan al -Fatimi. And in particular, I'll pre be presenting the arguments that we're making in this forthcoming article in Security Studies. So before I present our arguments, there are two introductory points that I want to make. The first regards why we focus on chemical weapons. So the conflict in Syria raises lots of interesting and important questions, some of which are being discussed by the other panel members today. Um, and it's not clear at all that if what you're trying to do is understand the Syrian conflict, you need to understand the role of chemical weapons in it. I think this also holds if your interest is in the humanitarian consequences of the Syrian conflict. Again, it's not clear that you should focus on chemical weapons for that. There are lots of other, probably greater aspects to the humanitarian situation that we see in Syria. But for questions about chemical weapons, Syria plays a large role. This is because it's the first major use of chemical weapons since the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s. The first recognized use of chemical weapons um, since the signing of the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1997, and also because Syria's agreement to give up its chemical weapons and join the Chemical Weapons Convention was a major achievement in 2013. Um, the second introductory point is that I'm going to be talking a lot about military utility, and we focus on military utility in this paper because it plays an important role in states' decisions regarding the use and acquisition of weapons. But I want to be clear that we are not implying that military utility is the only factor in those decisions, or that if a weapon has military utility, that it should be used. Okay, so what do we know about chemical weapons in the Syrian conflict? 
So one of the problems that we faced in our research is that the record on this is incomplete and unclear. By September 2016, there were more than 150 allegations of chemical weapons attacks. According to Human Rights Watch, though, only 85 cases can be confirmed from 2013 to 2017. And a commission established by the UN Human Rights Council re reports an even lower number of confirmed cases, 34, which are represented on this graph by Forbes up on the slide. So according to the UN Commission, there were five confirmed chemical weapons attacks in 2013, eight in 2014, 10 in 2016, and 11 in 2017. The graph also distinguishes the attacks by the agent that was used. So attacks with sarin, a nerve agent, are in orange. Attacks with chlorine, an industrial chemical, and a World War I era agent are in purple. And the green attacks are those in which the agent has not been determined. So the question that we focus on in our paper is whether the use of these weapons in Syria means that we will see further proliferation in use of these weapons in other conflicts. Will the example of Syria lead other states to change their CW policies? Will it make other states more likely to acquire and use these weapons? Does the use of chemical weapons in Syria and the international response to that use undermine the norm or taboo against chemical warfare or the Chemical Weapons Convention? So just to give you a preview of where we're going, our research suggests that Syria's use of chemical weapons is unlikely to lead to the further acquisition and use of these weapons by other states. Chemical weapons have had little military utility in Syria, providing little incentive for states to change their policies and acquire and use these weapons. The international community has responded to the use of chemical weapons in Syria signaling that chemical weapons are still taboo, and that the international community may impose costs in response to any future use by other states. While it's true that the international community's response has not eliminated the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime, it has consistently signaled that there are costs to the use of these weapons. So the current debate in the literature and in the policy world argues that the Syria case may undermine the norm by normalizing chemical weapons or by undermining deterrence by failing to impose heavy costs. So the economist has argued that if Syria's death squad is not punished, others will use chemical weapons. Theresa May, in justifying strikes against Syria, argues that the strikes will send a clear signal to anyone else who believes that they can use chemical weapons with impunity. A speaker at the first committee of the UN General Assembly argues that chemical weapons must not become the new normal. <laughs> Richard Price, who's a leading scholar of the chemical weapons taboo, has asked after Syria, is there still a taboo against the use of chemical weapons? And UN Secretary General um, is reported to have expressed alarm at a weakening What we argue, though, is that a key assumption in this debate has gone unexamined. <clears throat> the debate has assumed that chemical weapons in Syria have had military utility. We argue that in order for the Syrian case to encourage other states to acquire and use chemical weapons, it needs to demonstrate not just that the costs of use are low, but also that there are benefits to using them. So a key question for us is whether the use of chemical weapons in Syria has had military utility. Has it helped the Syrian regime to accomplish its goals? So there's one more bit of background that is important here. Almost all states in the world are members of the Chemical Weapons Convention, which embodies the taboo against chemical weapons and prohibits chemical warfare. The Chemical Weapons Convention has 193 state parties with only four states who are not full members, Egypt, South Sudan, Israel, and North Korea. 
This means that any unraveling of the chemical weapons norm will involve state parties abandoning the CWC, deciding that there is more to gain from having chemical weapons than there is to gain from an almost universal treaty that prohibits them. Given the benefits that most states have seen in the Chemical Weapons Convention, we argue that the use of chemical weapons in Syria would have to demonstrate clear military utility in order to get states to reconsider their chemical weapons policies. And only if states reverse their chemical weapons policies will we see significant future proliferation and use. So to develop our thinking on the military utility of chemical weapons, we turn to two different bodies of literature. The literature on chemical weapons, to see what it suggests about possible tactical or battlefield utility, and the literature on civilian victimization in order to understand how chemical weapons might be used in that kind of strategy. So according to the literature on chemical weapons in general, there are lots of ways that chemical weapons may be useful tactically. They can kill or injure large numbers of unprotected troops. They can help penetrate tunnels, caves, and other fortifications. Um, they can impose large logistical and operational challenges. To look for evidence of tactical utility, we situated our cases within the overall war and on current events on the ground. We then gathered information on the number of casualties, changes in control of territory, shifts in the momentum of the fighting, and evidence that chemical weapons undermined morale of opposition forces. The other body of literature that we use is that on civilian victimization. This literature understands civil war as a competition for the support of or control over population. The aim of civilian targeting is understood to be preventing civilians from helping the other side by directly killing them, by killing some as a deterrent, or by convincing civilians to flee. So in looking for evidence of the success or failure of chemical weapons in the strategy of civilian victimization, we gathered evidence on whether the use of chemical weapons in Syria has inhibited the ability of rebels to maintain their operations by decreasing civilian support, either through depopulation or by undermining morale. Okay. So in our research, we focus on two cases. The August 2013 sarin attack at Ghouta. This attack caused somewhere in the area of 1,400 deaths and then a series of chlorine barrel bomb attacks on the Hama Plains in the summer of 2014, which killed about 13 people. So why these two cases? Um, these cases, um, as I mentioned earlier, there are at least 167 alleged attacks, but there's little information available on most of them, and only a small number of them have been confirmed. Because of this lack of information, it wasn't possible to investigate all of these alleged cases or even a representative sample of them. We decided to focus on Gouda and the Hama Plains for the reasons on the slide. These cases have received lots of attention, so they'd be salient to actors thinking about chemical weapons in Syria and whether they're worth acquiring for, them, for other states. There have also been international investigations that have confirmed these attacks and provided credible information on them. And then across these two cases, we have variation in the type of chemical weapon agent used, with sarin and rockets used to Ghouta, and chlorine and barrel bombs used on the Hama Plains. So our sources have included official documentation from various international bodies, open source information in Arabic and English, including that provided by international and local NGOs, media reports, and secondary analyses. So what did we find? Chemical strikes in Ghouta had limited tactical utility. Despite the local impact in terms of casualties, the use of chemical weapons did not create military advantages for the Assad regime or lead to a significant change in the balance of power on the ground. The findings are similar for the chemical weapons attacks on the Hama Plains. 
There's no evidence that the chlorine attacks broke the morale of the opposition or aided regime advances. Turning to possible effectiveness in a strategy of civilian victimization, in Gouda, we found no evidence that the chemical attacks led to a collapse of civilian morale or of support for the rebel forces. And again, we found the same story on the Hamlet Plains. Rebels maintained enough civilian support to continue operations, and the chlorine attacks did not depopulate the region. But I just told you about an attack in 2013, an attack in 2014. And as you may know, chemical weapons have been used since then. So this raises two questions. First, have the more recent attacks had more military utility? And second, why does the regime keep using these weapons if they don't have utility? So in answer to the first question, we argue that the more recent attacks still do not demonstrate enough military utility to motivate other states to revise their chemical weapons policies. For example, in regard to Aleppo, the available information suggests that Russia's intervention and the increased air power that intervention provided um, played a more important role than chemical weapons and the regime's victory there. So what about the second question? Why does the regime keep using these weapons if they're not useful? Well, we don't know. Um, the Assad regime denies that it uses chemical weapons, so it hasn't explained any logic behind their use. And there are no records of decisions or discussions within the regime available. We can speculate, and a lot of people do speculate about this. Um, the regime might think that they're useful, even though they're not. Even if the regime knows that they're not very useful, they may be so desperate that they're throwing everything, including the kitchen sink, at the opposition. <coughs> or at least some of these attacks may have been tests of the international community's resolve and whether it would continue to impose costs for the use of chemical weapons. But again, because the data necessary to answer this question is not available, we explicitly designed our question and our research to exclude it. <coughs> our focus is not on why the Assad regime is using chemical weapons, but on what lessons about the costs and benefits of chemical weapons will be drawn by other states. So just some conclusions very quickly. Um, as used in Syria, chemical weapons have had limited military utility. The international response to the use of chemical weapons in Syria has reinforced the stigma attached to these weapons. There is therefore no reason to believe that the Syrian case will lead to significant proliferation in use that will overwhelm the chemical weapons norm. And just a caveat, of course this doesn't mean that we won't see any use of chemical weapons in the future. States with existing arsenals, States threatened with overthrow, or those already ostracized by the international community may be more likely to use these weapons. And the difference in the international community's response to the use of sarin, as opposed to the use of chlorine, suggests that when use does occur, it is more likely to involve the less lethal agents like chlorine. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think I'll use the prerogative of chair to actually, uh, you know, probe you a bit more on, on some of your, your findings. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah. My co-authors are here. So yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take one. <laughs> the um, obvious question. I'm going to be talking about military ethics and I've spent my entire career responding to the instant question, well that's an oxymoron isn't it? How do you explain military ethics? <laughs> the idea that um, in the, a situation in which the normal rules of civilised behaviour have broken down, 
you still have rules. For most people outside the military, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And yet military ethics is durable. It's endured for thousands of years. You'll find uh, the principles of uh, the restraint of war um, in some of our earliest writings. And it's also incredibly widespread. Um, you'd be hard pressed to find a culture or a, a religion that doesn't recognize the importance of, first of all, identifying when the exceptional act of war may be justified, but also how that exceptional act should be limited. So that's all very well, but how do you apply something like military ethics to a situation like Syria? A messy, complex situation. What on earth is the right thing to do in Syria at the moment for those of us looking into this situation? It's a good question. Um, the Atlantic magazine uh, a couple of months ago um, asked precisely that question and decided to ask a number of moral philosophers around the world what they would do. Um, they interviewed uh, Helen Frau, Peter Singer, Nancy Sherman, big, big names in, uh, who thought a lot about the normative aspect of the use of force in international affairs. Um, it's a fascinating piece. It's got a rather depressing conclusion, though, uh, which basically is, um, well, this is a lesson in why we should have intervened a long time ago. There's not a lot to say about what we should be doing now. And the reason that they can't contribute much about what we should be doing now is fairly obvious when you have a look at things like a traditional way of approaching the use of armed force in international affairs, something like the just war tradition. It's very, very hard to see how you could apply something like the Just War Tradition framework, an old, venerable framework that's evolved over something like two and a half thousand years of thinking. It's not a Western idea, it's a, it's a remarkably universal idea. Um, the criteria that it suggests on the ad bellum side about when military force may be justified and it's very hard to see how you can actually apply this to the Syria conflict and come up with anything other than, no, we shouldn't. The first criteria is easy. The just cause, there's a very clear just cause there, mass humanitarian catastrophe, crying out for somebody to do something to stop it. But very, very quickly, when you start going into the other criteria, you realise that that's not enough. Now, the just war criteria are a mixture of uh, prudential, uh, deontological, and consequentialist um, reasoning that basically try and determine when doing the exceptional might be permissible. That's what, that's what its job is. And so those criteria, it's not that it's a checklist that you go down and tick them all off, fantastic. But it is the case that the less satisfying the answers are to each of those six questions posed on the left, the less justifiable the literature intervention will be. Now, Helen Farrell, Peter Singer, Nancy Sherman were applying to such a framework, and you can see very, very quickly why, um, despite the just cause there, the argument for intervention falls very, very quickly. Don't need to go through all of them, but if you just focus on um, proportionality, for example, this is the idea that an intervention must do more good than harm. But the scale of the military operation, the scale of the strikes that would be necessary to change Assad's behavior, we've been very clearly warned, would be enough to trigger a more robust Russian engagement in this situation. So is it proportional to start the Third World War? I, I, I'm like, um, if the type of military operation that you're planning is not going to be of a sufficient level to change Assad's behaviour, then it's very hard to see how that could satisfy the reasonable prospect of success criteria. Basically, uh, the wasting of life to no actual benefit cannot be justified. And that's without getting into questions such as, um, how on earth do you work out the right intention of the Trump administration in this kind of situation? Very, very difficult. 
So despite the terrible suffering, the guidance of the Just War tradition suggests that a large-scale intervention is not, probably not the right thing to do. So in such a confused situation of changing sides, strange alliances, can the Just War tradition contribute anything? Can it give us any guidance about what we might want to do in this situation? Or how we might make judgments in this confused situation? Well, one of the things that the Just War tradition suggests, as you can see from the two lists of criteria there, is it separates out moral responsibility into two areas. The moral responsibility on the left resides with those who start conflicts, the princes, the governments, parliaments. The moral responsibility on the right-hand side is for those who actually conduct those hostilities. And traditionally, that makes a lot of sense. It, makes, it allows us to um, hold the right people to account. You don't hold the soldier responsible for the war in which they're fighting. This is articulated, we, we talked about remembrance earlier with World War I presentations, but it's, um, it's more recent as well. The people of Royal Wood and Bassett coming out and showing their respect to the fallen soldiers from uh, Afghanistan. They weren't showing support for the war, that's not the point. That was not what they were doing. What they were doing was showing support for the soldiers that had fallen in that war. They understood innately, intrinsically, that, that there's a separation between these two levels of responsibility. This wasn't a pro or anti-war demonstration. It was simply a demonstration of respect. Um, so, this traditional distinction between the two levels of moral responsibility has stuck with us throughout the history of the Just War tradition. It's recently been challenged, though, and you can see why it's been challenged with more contemporary events. Surely, sometimes you must realize you're fighting on a side which is just so wrong that you must realize that you're on the wrong side. You must do, surely. And if you're fighting on the wrong side, why on earth should you be treated as a morally equal to the person who's fighting on the right side. And that's a, a, a fundamental challenge uh, the Just War revisionists are posing at the moment. Surely sometimes people just must know they're on the wrong side. But actually that's, that's quite a big ask. It's all very well to assume perfect knowledge, metaphysical truth if you like. But I'd be willing to bet that there's quite a lot of people fighting for Assad that are doing it to save their families from the threat of what ISIS will do to them if their homes are overrun. Does that mean every soldier that's fighting for Assad is morally fine? No, of course not. The moral distinction the just war tradition asks you to draw is not that it doesn't matter who's fighting. The point is it doesn't matter which side you're fighting on. You're still responsible for your actions in that but nobody knowingly fights for a cause they know to be just. There is a certain moral equality there. And if you don't believe that, then you have some real challenges in situations where, are you sure you're on the right side? We commit our armed forces. Are they always on the right side? If you don't allow that separation of moral responsibility, you're putting an awfully heavy weight on the people that you're sending to do your dirty work. So does that mean that every Syrian soldier is blameless? No, not at all. That's not what the Just War tradition says at all. What it says is that you don't blame the Syrian pilot for flying on behalf of Assad. You blame the Syrian pilot for rolling the barrel bomb onto the civilian population. That's what they should be held responsible for. It's the division of the moral responsibility in understanding that. And the Just War tradition is quite useful for explaining that kind of moral distinction, I'd suggest. So you blame for the action, not the side. That's, that's how the just war tradition can be applied to value judgments in this kind of situation. But where else can normative theory help here? Whilst the just war tradition might rule out large-scale intervention, that's very different from saying that nothing could be justified. So, if you could aid or assist others already there to stop some of the worst excesses and protect some people, could that be the right thing to do? 
Well, it's not wi widely advertised, of course, but there are boots on the ground now from the West. It's not easy to find a blameless ally to work with, but we are working with people on the ground. Some groups are clearly better than others. Special forces from the West are currently involved with a wide range of support, training and assist operations, sometimes thought that referred to as through, with or by. But who to help? And can normative theory help us at all here? Well, it's, it's uh, how the US refers to the type of operations that are going on at the moment. They refer to it as unconventional warfare, so we'll ignore the debates about that title. But um, it consists of operations and activities that are conducted to enable resistance movements or insurgency to coerce, disrupt, or overthrow a government or occupying power by operating through or with an underground, auxiliary, and guerrilla force in a denied area. So through, with, or by a third party surrogate's actual efforts. But who to help? Who to help? If it might be ethically okay to help somebody who's already there, who do you choose? Now, there's been institutionalized attempts to answer that question. Um, the Lee Amendment in the US Foreign Policy Assistant Act, Assistance Act 1997 attempts to do this. It introduced a vetting process so that um, uh, US Special Forces, for example, cannot partner with uh, those who fail the vetting process, obvious violators of human rights, anybody with an appalling human rights record, are automatically banned from being um, supported through uh, this kind of work. But of course, as in other walks of life, this doesn't help with post-vetting behaviour. It's just like when you have your criminal record bureau check, that only, uh, that only accounts for whether or not you've been caught up till now, not what you might do in the future. So how do you know that the force that you're going to be working with is actually going to stay morally acceptable to, to work with? The law in this case isn't terribly helpful. It um, tends to focus on command responsibility, which generally is not applicable for this type of operation. So a war crime committed that's not under my command, well, it's not my problem, is it? It's um, up to somebody else to sort that out. But it's, of course it's not just war crimes. There are other areas of activity that um, would appear to come under local legal jurisdiction rather than your own legal uh, rules. How do you navigate that kind of minefield? Uh, Baka Bazi, the um, uh, local coalition partners in Afghanistan, for example, uh, historically would take prepubescent boys and rape them traditionally on a Thursday night so that you can pray for absolution on the Friday. How are you supposed to partner up with somebody like that? What does the law help for the people <laughs> who are actually in that situation working along with such coalition partners? Um, well, the law says um, that this is a domestic issue and must be dealt with domestically. So that doesn't seem to be terribly helpful here. There's no requirement, there's no Good Samaritan requirement in British or American or Australian law, for example. But it seems to me that morally you can't walk away from responsibility by saying law doesn't require me to act in this situation. So can military ethics bridge the gap? And I think it can. In fact, I think the just war tradition can help bridge the gap here. The just war tradition is a very flexible framework. It's not simply about traditional state-on-state -state conflict, despite what some of the revisionists might say. It's actually a way of thinking about when you might be justified in doing something which is exceptional, something which is normally against the rules. So going to war against another state is something exceptional, and therefore that's how we're used to applying this criteria. But it's also useful in this situation. It can be a guide for behavior for when, when to support a surrogate and when not to. Now, Dean Peter Baker, my colleague in the uh, University of New South Wales, uh, suggested these titles might be helpful in this situation. How would you apply these principles to know who to work with? Well, just running through them very quickly in the last minute. Um, just cause, does the surrogate force have a just cause for their own participation? That might be self-defense, but it, it might be the protection of the innocent. It might be a different just cause to why the sponsor feels they need to be involved, but that's okay as long as both parties have a just cause. Legitimate authority. Does the surrogate force represent the interests of a significant body of local people? If it doesn't, then basically you're just talking about mercenaries. Right intention. 
got to keep a close eye on this to ensure that the motivation does not go beyond the original just cause. Proportionality. Will the benefits of helping the surrogates outweigh the negative effects? You can't see the future, obviously, but it's asking you to make a well-intentioned judgment about what you can predict, what you can clearly predict there. Prospect of success. Can they actually achieve their goals? If not, don't support them. It also asks you to keep an eye on whether or not they've run out of steam, in which case you shouldn't be supporting them anymore at all either. And letting your surrogate partner know that you might withdraw your support is an important part of that contract to start with. Finally, last resort, the proliferation of armed groups generally should be avoided, I would suggest. So, can we reasonably uh, achieve the desired just outcome without arming, training, and otherwise enabling a non-state or irregular group? i.e. is this really necessary? On the in bello proportionality discrimination side, we should train equip to promote discrimination and uh, continue to influence positively there. From the proportionality side, you should only provide as much help as is actually required. Where the cause is just but large scale intervention is impossible, working through, with and by is one of the alternative tools in the state toolbox. We can't ignore the moral and ethical implications of what our local allies and partners do with our help, though. We can't simply say it's got nothing to do with us if we're facilitating their actions. So I'd suggest that normative theory can contribute something useful, even in the most complex conflicts imaginable. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, and thank you to all the panelists. This was uh, truly uh, fascinating. Um, we have plenty of time, uh, well, not plenty, uh, we will be in the, the whole day and, and tomorrow as well, but at least half an hour to uh, take questions uh, uh, from, from the audience, uh, comments.